Hi, my name is John Marler, call sign Kilo 4 Charlie Hotel November, K4chan. Today I'll be giving you a presentation that's an introduction to the common digital modes used by amateur radio operators. But before we get into that, I'm going to introduce myself. Uh, my first ham radio was given to me by my grandfather. It was a Lafayette KT200. Still have it, recently rebuilt it. Um, I now know that it's called a boat anchor, and I know why. Uh, I first took the technician test at DEF CON 27, passed it on my first try. Uh, took the, attempted the general right after, did not pass the general. Um, studied hard, came back the next year, and, uh, and passed my general. I spend a lot of time uh, on voice modes on 40 meters, um, but I am fairly active uh, on 40 meters on FT8. And I'll talk more about what FT8 is uh, later when I talk about the data modes. That's one of the digital modes we'll talk about today. Um, I also have been known to do a lot of lurking on 14.230 for uh, SSTV images. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about this, but this is something that's really easy to do, even if you don't have a uh, amateur radio license. And, uh, you know, one of my hobbies is fixing a lot of things. Um, I know this is information security conference and people, you know, like to talk about all the letters behind their names and all the stuff they do in InfoSec, but um, kind of one of my big hobbies is uh, fixing electronics and building electronics. And a lot of times when I fix things, I have to break them more first. So uh, with that introduction out of the way, uh, let me talk about uh, the agenda for today. So first I'm going to give you a brief introduction to some of the common voice digital modes uh, that are available. And uh, we'll talk about some of the commercial and the open source uh, digital voice modes. And then we'll get into the digital data modes. Uh, this is where uh, a lot of people um, are, are very active. And there's a lot of different things you can do in terms of data uh, for the digital modes. Throughout this presentation, I'll be talking about various forms of hardware uh, that is both commercial and uh, open source or DIY. And uh, I'll even show you a, a very simple kind of basic DIY solution that I came up with for how to uh, easily enable uh, push to talk control on a, on a physical radio from a Raspberry Pi um, in a way that makes it easy to connect to different radios. Um, so I'll, I'll be talking about that. And then finally, I'll conclude with a, a pre-recorded demo of a, an SSTV QSO that I, uh, that I do with my father-in-law. So uh, let's start by talking about digital voice. Um, and really, before we get too deep into this, um, let's, let's talk about a little bit about what a digital voice signal is. And um, you know, we all know as, as uh, radio operators what a, uh, a, a radio signal is. You, you take a carrier wave, you have an input signal, and you apply those two and you get a modulated signal. Um, really the difference kind of at a, at a very high level between analog and, and digital is that the input signal that you're applying on that carrier wave is a encoded digital uh, voice signal um, rather than an analog voice signal. And, and that's really kind of like at a 10,000 foot level the difference. Um, once you get beyond that and you start to go deeper into the layers of how that actually works, one of the things you have to think about um, with digital voice is how do you define a channel and how do you deal with uh, multiple people or multiple transmission sources uh, all speaking in the same uh, frequency range or in the same uh, uh, section of bandwidth, if you will? And how do you divide that bandwidth up? Um, so there's a bunch of different methodologies for that. Um, two of the more popular ones are uh, FDMA and TDMA. And one divides uh, up that bandwidth by the frequency and one divides it up by the time, um, so uh, time division or frequency division. Um, so those are two of the more popular ones, and you can actually combine the two. So you can do FDMA and TDMA at the same time. Um, so you can divide into, you know, instead of say two channels or four channels, uh, you can have uh, 16 channels. And every time you divide it up into smaller pieces, uh, depending on the, uh, the mode of in, the the mode that you're using that may limit the bandwidth that you have, um, and it may change how that works. Um, so, it, kind of like at a, I won't get too deep into the theory here, but 
Um, I wanted to give you just kind of a, like a little brief introduction in that. If you're really interested in the theory, there's a lot of uh, interesting stuff you can read on Wikipedia and, uh, and other websites. So when you get right down to it, um, what are some of the ways uh, that you can, what are some of the implementations of digital voice? Um, really, every, most of these systems use what's called AMBE or AMBE plus two um, as their voice encoder. Um, and the voice encoder is kind of the first step um, to uh, digital voice communications. Um, and what a voice encoder does is it takes your, an, an analog voice signal and it digitizes it. Um, so the AMBE system, which is the most popular, is also a little bit controversial because it is patented um, and it's still protected by a patent and it requires a license from a company called Digital Voice Systems Incorporated. Um, usually the way that this is achieved by the, the commercial manufacturers, um, the little chips that you see there on the screen in the bottom right corner, those are DVSI voice encoder chips and they include that license so when you buy the chip you also get a license. Uh, which basically means digital voice systems gets a little piece of it. This is a slight bit controversial because of the, in the U.S., the FCC rule that says any transmission is must not use proprietary technology. Um, and while the the spec is basically open, it's encumbered by a patent and it requires um, paying the patent owner uh, for a license. Um, so, it, it, as a response to this, um, there are a couple of open source implementations of digital voice. There's uh, FreeDV and M17 are two of the more popular ones. Um, and, that, and these use a voice encoder that's not encumbered by patents. Uh, but the commercial solutions, like we have up here, the D-Star, uh, the Yaesu System Fusion, also their Wires X, um, and DMR, Digital Mobile Radio, uh, and also P25. These all use that, uh, that AMBE system that um, requires that, uh, that commercial chip. And when you buy a radio, it's not something you really have to worry about, but it is something that you should at least know. Um, and really the most important thing here is that for the most part, uh, you need to have a system that is compatible uh, when you're, it is compatible with the other person you want to speak to. So if you want to speak to someone who has a D-Star radio and they're transmitting uh, D-Star and, and they can receive D-Star, you need to have a system that's D-Star compatible. Um, and that's kind of really the, the most important thing to understand here is that uh, most of these protocols aren't compatible with each other. You can't talk to a DMR radio with a, a Yaesu System Fusion compatible digital radio. Um, because those they're they're different. Uh, they use different tech. The the technology is basically different. Uh, without getting too far into the weeds on that, so that's really the important thing to understand. Um, if there's say there's a lot of uh, of groups, um, ham groups around the world, that uh, that kind of choose a platform, whether it be M17 or Yesu System Fusion, and uh, you know, and they all kind of uh, uh, you know. Uh, they, they all work with that same system and if you're interested in getting involved with those groups you need to make sure that the hardware you buy is compatible with that so um, just something to know uh, Yesu System Fusion uh, also referred to as YSF um, a lot of times you'll see as you know as a ham operator there's a million um, abbreviations that you need to know so YSF is what people will use for Yesu uh, System Fusion um, which YSF is uh, different from Wires X, um, and uh, it, it, without getting too deep into the, the weeds on that, y, uh, Wires X is a system that is connected to the internet, and you can also connect to from a radio, um, and that gets repeated onto the internet. And I'll talk more about that when I talk about hotspots, but um, that's a different that's a different uh, style of system, and it requires a different connection method than just a, say, a repeater that uses uh, YSF digital modes. So, one of the questions, um, you know, is people often ask is, well, why would I want to use a digital voice mode? I, I can use a, an analog voice mode, and I can talk to any radio on the planet. Why would I want to use a proprietary digital voice mode? And really, the the reason is uh, you get a, a much you, you're more likely to have a good connection with a weaker signal. So the the graph that I've got here on the screen kind of shows how that uh, that arc looks. And if you compare 
the, the analog signal, um, you can see where that starts to drop off. Um, the voice quality starts to drop off and it has a rather steady decline out um, pretty far to where um, where you're not going to have very good quality and you're going to have a hard time making good making QSOs and making contacts and having people understand you. Um, whereas with the digital modes, um, they're, a lot, they're a lot better at making a good connection with even a weak signal, uh, but then they fall off a cliff really fast. Um, so once that signal gets to a certain level of weakness, um, depending on the mode, um, that falls off a cliff pretty fast and it just, it just basically stops working. Um, it's very similar to if you ever use digital TV. Um, you really you get a really great crystal clear picture. It just drops out almost entirely. It, digital voice is almost the same way. So um, that's one of the main reasons that people use digital voice. Uh, also, depending on the system that you're connecting to, if you're connected to something like a Wires X digital system, uh, there's all sorts of things that you can connect to. Like um, they have rooms and channels and um, all of these rooms and channels can also be connected over long distances by uh, the internet. So if you have, say, a local repeater that's on two meters uh, that you can talk to, uh, that you can reach from your area, and it's a Wires X, um, it's a Wires X node, and you can connect to it, and then you can talk to hams that are on the other side of the world, um, just using your, you know, relatively uh, otherwise low-powered radio that can that can talk to that Wires X node. Um, you can join in a rooms and they have lively discussions about different things and different topics. So um, that can be really fun and it's a, a great way to meet people and talk to people. So uh, that's something that uh, I, if you have the, the right kind of equipment, I definitely recommend checking it out. I have a, a Yaesu FT991 and it's Wires X compatible. And when you get it to work, it's, it's pretty cool. Um, so I, I definitely recommend checking it out. But, um, you know, e each of the, the different manufacturers uh, have their own versions of that. So... Let's say I've convinced you. You're like, this sounds great, John. Um, I'm sold. How do I get started in digital voice? Uh, there's really, you know, uh, two ways. Uh, one is you buy a, a, a radio that's compatible with digital voice. Um, like I said, I have a Yaesu FT991. Uh, it does the, uh, the Yaesu System Fusion. It does Wires X. Um, it's, it, you know, it's the, the shack in the box, if you will. Um, and it made it really easy for me to get started in digital modes um, because it just kind of does it right out of the box. Um, and uh, Wires X is a little bit of a challenge to get set up um, uh, and find a node that works over the radio, but once you get it set up and you get it working, it's really cool. Um, ICOM has their own version of digital, um, uh, the IC7100 and 7300, I believe. Um, and also I have up there on the screen the ID52, which is a handheld digital radio might only be available in Japan right now. Um, there's a chip shortage, everything, and uh, I think they're having production problems right now. Um, so those are all, and, and even I've got a, I've got a Pofung up there. Um, uh, they have a digital radio that is DMR compatible. Um, so uh, there's that as well. One of the other ways is kind of more the DIY route, if you will. Um, and you can build what's, uh, what's called a, a hotspot. Um, and the cool thing about a hotspot is uh, you can you use something like a Raspberry Pi and you have a little uh, a little radio that you connect to it and you can connect to the radio over uh, a very low power um, you know using just QRP uh, bandwidth basically and then that digital hotspot will may, will convert that into a digital signal over the internet and then it can connect to other digital hotspots and then that can be rebroadcast or um, you can talk to hams online that are just completely online. So um, that's another way you can get started with that. Um, people love the hotspots. Um, the hotspots are a great way to um, bridge between networks. Um, so some of the hotspots you can connect to with your with your Yesu radio, and then you can get onto a common network. Um, so it, it really depends. There's a lot of stuff you can do with that, and you can really, if you like to tinker with the electronics, um, the, the Raspberry Pi hats are a great way to do that and get started on that. Really, um, you know, in the open spot is a, is a great hotspot that's kind of a commercial version of a hotspot. Um, and it does all the different digital modes and it's got its own battery built in. It's a little expensive, but um, if you're looking for something that's more, uh, that's less DIY and, and, uh, and more kind of, oh, not quite plug and play, but as close to plug and play as you're going to get, uh, something like that, the open spot's a great, uh, a great choice. 
Um, and uh, to talk about the Ham Radio Village, there's a lot of digital stuff that the Ham Radio Village uh, uh, offers. Um, I'm not going to go through each one of these here, but um, if you check out their uh, their Twitter page, which is um, really easy, it's at Ham Radio Village on Twitter. Um, they have a, a sticky post up there that talks about all of the hotspots that are available and all the digital modes and how to connect to all that. So, and this this information's up here. Um, they've got you know, Yaesu System Fusion, not Wires X, but uh, the YSF. Um, they've got that set up, an M17, DMR, D-Star, um, in two different modes of D-Star. There's two different, there's a few different modes. So um, if you have a digital radio and you're going to be at the con and you're, you're looking to connect to that, um, so uh, definitely check that out and check out their Twitter page or, uh, or just uh, take a screenshot of this and, and uh, check it out. So now that I've talked about uh, the voice modes, let's talk a little bit about data. Um, and this is where it gets really interesting. So the first data mode that I'm going to talk about is RTTY. And this is really kind of the first widely adopted digital mode. Um, I'm not going to say it, it, it's the first. Um, I think it's the first, but I, it's the first that was, uh, if it's not absolutely the first, it's the first that gained a lot of uh, uh, popular adoption. Um, the speed for uh, for RTTY is about six characters per second, um, so not very fast. Uh, it uses a method of transmission called Murray or Baudot code, um, and uh, it's it's very slow. So 45.5 baud. Um, there were some improvements that were made to it over the years, so you can get up to 75 baud. Uh, but with the limited character set that it has, um, there's not a whole lot of uh, messages that it, it it's very limited to what you can send. Um, this was used by the U.S. Navy, and one of those pictures up there is actually a U.S. Navy uh, a, uh, RTTY station um, back when radios could fill entire rooms, uh, and it took, you know, entire rooms to have uh, very basic computers. Uh, that's what it looked like. Um, and this uses frequency shift keying as its, uh, as its modulation method for, uh, for sending that. Um, so... Uh, one of the problems that, the, that we have with RTTY is it's very prone to interference and it has no error correction. So that means uh, the side that's receiving doesn't really know if, uh, if there was an error in the transmission or something was missed. Um, it has no way to request a retry. Um, when you monitor RTTY, the radios, um, uh, you just get random characters. You can just be listening to what sounds like static and you'll see random characters pop up. So um, I've tried to, uh, I've, I've tried several times on RTTY and, and I haven't had a whole lot of luck, but, um, that may be due to the fact that I have a really, uh, I have a homemade antenna and it's probably not perfectly tuned and I don't have a great tuner. I use the tuner built into the Yaesu. So, um, this is something where you need to have a really clear signal in order to, to be able to effectively communicate. Uh, so I've got samples of this. The sample I'm going to play is, uh, call sign, uh, RU3 AMO calling CQ on 14047. This is what it sounds like. Kind of sounds like those old, uh, those old 50s space movies when you hear like the space sounds, you see a satellite and you'd hear that noise and it's a Murray Bada code. And, and that's why, because that's what they used to use to communicate. Um, so the next thing I'm gonna talk about is phase shift keying which is different from um, the frequency shift keying. This is a different type of uh, modulation. And there's a lot of different modes. Um, there's, there's a ton of them. Um, so what, the most popular one, the one that you'll hear about the most is PSK31. Um, this was created by Peter Martinez. Um, it, that's the most popular mode. And uh, the chart that I have or the table that I have there shows the different frequencies that are very common for using PSK. Um, so if you're looking to get into PSK or listening to PSK or uh, trying to make uh, make contacts on PSK, those are some good frequencies to try. Um, this one's also pretty slow. It's 31 baud um, using BPSK modulation. Um, and uh, some of the modes here are very resistant to crowding interference, um, which means you're more likely to make a QSO. Um, it's not quite as bad as RTTY. Um, and some of the modes even have error correction. Um, so error correction is great because it, it helps you get a better signal. Um, and the system at least knows when, uh, when an error has been received and how to correct it using, uh, using the, the, the encoding that it has. 
Um, so there's a whole bunch of different software that you can use for that. I've got a few examples up here. FL Digi is probably um, the, that's the one I'm most familiar with, um, but there's a whole bunch of other ones out there. Um, really, uh, PSK31 was developed to be about as, fat, about as fast as someone typing 51 words per minute. Um, I type 100 words per minute. Uh, but uh, I've been typing a long time. So uh, there are other modes, um, PSK63 and PSK125, that transmit faster. Um, so they would, uh, you know, uh, be able to accommodate me. And really, PSK31 was kind of built as a, an improvement to the uh, slow BPSK, um, uh, which was uh, created by uh, Sierra Papa 9 Victor uh, Radio Charlie. So. Um, this is a really neat mode. Um, this one's, uh, you'll have better luck with this than RTTY, and I have, an I have a sample of that one here. Yeah, so that one does kind of sound like a whistling with maybe with water in your mouth. Um, so uh, if you hear that, uh, that's, that's what that is. If you're, you're uh, you know, surfing around uh, looking for someone to, to talk to. Uh, so next I'll talk about packet. Um, Packet, what we call packet radio in, in terms of amateur, um, is really AX25 in digital. And this was first used by Canadian uh, amateur radio operators in 1978. Um, the Montreal Amateur Radio Club kind of like uh, pioneered this and developed this technology and started using it. Um, and it was authorized for use in the U.S. by the FCC in 1980 because we need permission from the government for everything. Um, so one of the things that is unique about this mode of is you need a uh, basically a modem or what we call a terminal node controller a TNC um, so I've got a, an example a picture up there of one um, there are a lot of different uh, TNCs out there there are tons of them um, and there's even software ones there's a great software one called uh, called direwolf um, that I use and uh, using a software TNC is great because if you have a way to connect a computer to your your ham radio and uh, especially with the ability to do uh, push to talk from the computer um, it makes it really easy to get online with direwolf um, and i'll even show a solution here later on for how to do that how to connect a raspberry pi to a radio um, one of the most uh, popular methods or most popular implementations of this is the aprs system or automated packet reporting system this is really a system that's designed to report locations, to say, I'm here, I'm, I'm in a car and I'm driving and this is my GPS, these are my GPS coordinates. Um, and it's kind of a way for hams to, to be able to find each other um, and, and kind of share the location, uh, like the original Foursquare, if you will. Um, so you can also send messages and uh, these, a lot of these TNCs have the ability to store and forward. Um, so if you're trying to send a message to someone and they're unavailable, um, well, you can go a certain number of hops and then uh, that message can be stored until that the receiver is available and then it can be sent on. Um, and this can happen over the radio. Um, it can also happen over the internet. So you can connect to the APRS network um, uh, with just with software over the internet. Uh, they require a password, but there's just Google APRS password generator and you don't need to ask anybody for an APRS password. It's, it's not complicated. Um, someone figured that out. So uh, APRS is really great. Um, it's good for things like telemetry. Um, it, there's short email messages, it's more like text messages that you can send. Um, and you know, a lot of times it's used by storm spotters and people to share information and say, hey, I'm out here and there's a tornado or um, we're having bad weather. So um, that, that's a, a great system to use. I've been, I, I built an APRS uh, capable system so that I can do that mobile. Um, and uh, most times you'll see this packet mode being used on, uh, on two meters. Um, so there's a whole bunch of different networks that, that you can connect to. I've got some examples up there, uh, TARPN and TexNet and BBS and other that. Um, there's a whole bunch of them. Sometimes they're regional. Um, so check to see what's available in your area. There might be a, a good packet network that you can uh, that you can get onto and uh, and talk to other hams uh, and get to know people there. And this is what packet sounds like. Yeah, very similar to like the uh, the old uh, Commodore 64 tapes. 
So uh, this is probably one of my more favorite uh, uh, digital modes, and this is what I'll be doing a demo demonstration or a demo of later. This is slow scan television. Uh, so this is a really old digital mode. Um, this was uh, developed in the 1950s. And if you think back to the 1950s, people didn't have computers in their homes. So how would you digitize video um, or television and transmit it over the radio? And they used these things called Viticon tubes to uh, basically take an analog signal uh, and make a video signal and then transmit it over the radio. Um, so uh, this was eventually a, a officially approved by the FCC for amateur use in 1968. Um, they used SSTV on the Apollo mission. Um, the Apollo mission to the moon sent SSTV images back to Earth uh, for pictures of the uh, astronauts originally walking on the moon. So um, that's how long this has been out there and in use. Um, it started off kind of just as black and white, but now you can do color and there's there's dozens of, of different modes. Um, you know, Scotty One is a popular one and uh, there's one called Robot, and there's a bunch of different modes. And a lot of the software that you can use to decode SSTV will do this automatically. And you can get software to decode SSTV for your phone. Um, there's an app in the iPhone store. There's a bunch of apps on Android for it. Um, there's apps for Windows, Linux, Mac OS. Um, the most popular app, I think, is MMSSTV on Windows. And you'll see a lot of times... Um, when people transmit images, you'll see it'll say MMS TV across the top because one of the default templates includes the name MMS TV. So you'll see that a lot. Um, but this is a, a great mode that you could get into because you don't need a license to receive these images. Um, if you're just going to listen, you can do that easily. Uh, the International Space Station transmits slow scan television images quite regularly and they're about to do that again here um, so you can get an app that'll tell you when the uh, the ISS is going to be over your part of the world um, you can tune to the frequency that they broadcast on set your phone nearby and when an image comes in you'll you, you can you can turn on the auto the uh, the auto start and auto mode and it'll just you'll receive it um, and it's it's pretty cool you get messages you can get a, an image from space over the radio um, so this is a really fun one this is what I'm gonna do a demonstration of later and uh, uh, this is what it sounds like, at least one of the modes. So next we have MFSK. <clears throat> MFSK or Multi Frequency Shift King. Um, this is one of the uh, one of the more popular digital modes that people use today, uh, and. The thing that's that people like about this digital mode is it is very good at transmitting very weak signals across very long distances. And the reason for that is it uses um, tropospheric scatter phenomenon. Um, so basically that means the radio waves at the UHF and SHF frequencies are randomly scattered as they pass through the upper layers of the troposphere. Um, the radio signals are then transmitted in a narrow beam aimed at just above the horizon, uh, the horizon in the direction of the receiver station. So uh, as the signals pass through the troposphere, some of that energy is then scattered back towards the, alert, uh, towards the Earth, which allows the receiver station to pick up the signal. So um, basically, uh, you know, this used to be called skip, I think, um, yeah, because you kind of skip along the, the, uh, the, uh, the, the troposphere. Um, there's a lot of different modes for this, um, for MFSK. And um, <clears throat> the large number of modes makes it really a little bit confusing, but also easy to get started because you can just kind of pick a mode and, uh, and gain proficiency in it and then make QSOs really easy. Um, so uh, there's a piece of software that's kind of taken, taken off with this and really made this popular called WSJTX. Um, and if you type WSJTX into YouTube, you'll find a million videos of, of hams showing off what WSJTX do. And if you go to a field day, there's going to be two or three hams that have a Raspberry Pi and an iPad or a, a little laptop um, and connect it to the radio, and they'll show you all the things that are happening on FT8. Um, FT8 is one of the, one of the um, MFSK modes that's more popular. Um, so it, this makes it really easy because you can, uh, you can send signal reports. So you can call for CQ, and you can send a signal report, and then uh, 73 
which qualifies as a QSO. So you can make QSOs and log them in QRZ or uh, LOTW or um, you know any one of the popular uh, logging platforms online. Um, and there's a mode called Whisper or WSPR. And this mode is more like a, a one-way mode where you're just kind of uh, broadcasting a signal and the report back that that signal has been heard is made over the internet. So once you broadcast on Whisper, um, anyone that hears you then reports that into a central database on the internet. And what this is good for is it's good for testing what kind of propagation you're getting. Um, so if you've ever wondered, you know, I'm, I'm on my radio and I'm transmitting, I don't know, am I getting, is, is, is there anybody out, anybody hearing me? Am I having a problem with my radio, a problem with my antenna? Is my antenna not tuned? And, and am I getting interference from somewhere? Is the, you know, someone next door got a, a something that's leaking so much RF, it's, it's bleeding over my radio and nobody can, nobody can hear me? Uh, Whisper's a great way for you to get on the system. You broadcast a Whisper message. Um, it takes a long time, actually, to broadcast a whis Whisper message. Um, but you can get on, you can broadcast, and then within seconds, you can check a map um, online in, in a web page and see exactly how far your signal propagated and who heard you. Um, so this makes it really easy. You can see what, what bands are open right now, right now for you and who can hear you. And um, it's, it's actually pretty great. Um, so Whisper is really good for kind of understanding what, you know, what your capabilities are right then and there and not by theory, but by actual testing. So you get empirical data. Um, so I definitely recommend using Whisper, um, especially if you're wondering, you know, I'm calling CQ and no one's, no one's responded to me. Is it, can anybody hear me? Um, it's a great way to test your radio um, and understand what you're, de you're getting. There's even a method uh, or a mode in J uh, WSJTX that's designed to bounce your signal off the moon. Um, so that's just kind of cool to me to think, well, I can bounce a radio signal off the moon uh, and receive it back uh, here on Earth. That's just kind of awesome. So... Uh, this is what one of the MFSK modes sounds like. That one, this one sounds a little spooky to me. Uh, it, it sounds like ghosts in the ether to me. Uh, it's just it's just kind of eerie to me. But um, yeah, it's interesting. Uh, Raytheon has been using MFSK uh, in the military for quite a while, and they've developed an MFSK system uh, for military use, obviously, that can make a 100 megabit per second radio link over extremely long distances through the troposphere. So, um, you know, there's there's a lot of potential with this type of technology. Um, I, I'm sure they're never going to let civilians use anything like that anytime soon, but um, it, it's kind of cool to know that capability is out there. So if you're kind of interested, like, uh, uh, in, in getting into some of these digital modes and, and some of these data modes especially, um, one of the things that you're going to need to be able to do is connect a computer to your radio. And by connecting the computer to the radio, you're going to need to make kind of like three basic connections. One is um, audio in, the next is audio out, and then finally you're going to have to make a push-to-talk connection. What that means is your computer or your TNC or whatever device you're connecting to the radio needs to be able to control the push to talk. Uh, so there's a lot of different ways to do this. Um, you know, some use serial ports and you turn the clear to send or ready to send on and off and that, that triggers your push to talk. Um, but most radios, a, a lot of radios at least, have just basically a, a, a hardwired connection that you can short to ground and that turns on push to talk. Um, so I bought a really kind of old radio, an old, uh, Ken, this old Kenwood radio that's a, a two meter radio. Uh, I think it's 25 watts maybe. Uh, yeah, about 25 watts if I remember correctly. And I got it for $15. And part of the reason for that is uh, if you look at it, um, there's no way on this radio through the, the, the the knobs and dials on the front to enter in a specific frequency. All of the frequencies that this radio uses have to be programmed using a, a serial, using a serial cable, a, a programming cable. Um, and it uses this really proprietary connector that connects onto the front 
Um, you can kind of see it there in the photo. Um, it's got this round connector that's proprietary. Um, and the, you can get the programming cables for about 35, 40 bucks. Uh, and then you have to have, you know, uh, their proprietary Kenwood microphone, which uh, again is, you know, another 20, 30 bucks, depending on which one you buy. And um, so a lot of people, so this radio, it, uh, it sold for $15. It didn't have the, the proprietary programming cable with it. It didn't have the little, uh, the, uh, the, the microphone with the proprietary cable. It has a proprietary power connector on the back and a DB25 um, and just a standard kind of uh, UHF style antenna connector. Um, so it, these radios don't sell for a whole lot. A lot of people that sell them don't even know how to test it or turn it on. Um, one, of the th one of the interesting things about this radio is they're designed to be used in vehicles um, so there is a, uh, a mode that you can turn on or enable in these where it won't turn on. Even if you plug in the proprietary power cable, it won't turn on unless uh, an extra power is, an uh, extra power signal is applied to uh, the, uh, basically the engine on signal uh, for the radio to indicate that the, that the vehicle is started and running. So a lot of times these things are sold as dead, but they're not dead. Is the person just doesn't know that, um, that tested it. So I got this, this, this thing for $15. It works perfectly fine. Um, I tore the proprietary connector out of the back of the thing, put an Anderson power pole uh, power connector on it. Um, <clears throat> I hardwired it so that it doesn't need the, the vehicle sense indicator. Uh, and I, I also soldered on uh, uh, two, two wires so that I could program it using a, a TTL serial cable rather than buying the $40 proprietary cable. And there's some open source 3D printable solutions for that that have little circuit boards. And I just, I looked at that and I said, you know, that's that's awesome. I love that people do stuff like that. But it was just way too easy for me to just solder on two wires onto the onto the circuit board and, and program it that way. So that's what I did. Um, and what I did was I programmed in the APRS frequency first. Um, when I, when, I, uh, when I downloaded the list of frequencies, it, it looked like this was used as a, in a fire truck or some kind of a... Um, a fireman's uh, uh, vehicle, uh, support vehicle, or a fire truck itself. It was very dirty and I had to clean it. Um, but anyways, uh, one of the things that this radio has is a DB25 connector on the back. And uh, the documentation for this radio is online and you can go find out what all the pins are for the DB25. And the DB25 has uh, an audio in and an audio out. And it also has a push to talk pin. And when that push to talk pin is shorted to ground, uh, that enables push to talk. So I said, great. Um, and that makes these specific Kenwood radios really easy to connect to something like a Raspberry Pi. Um, so I wanted a quick and easy way to connect to my Raspberry Pi. So I designed this little very basic uh, circuit. Um, I bought a uh, what's called a, a prototype hat for the Raspberry Pi on Amazon. Uh, I bought an opto isolator, or I had an opto isolator from uh, probably from either DigiKey or Mauser, one of those two, and uh, and a, a 3.5 millimeter jack. And uh, you can see the the diagram that I made there. Um, I have uh, in the in the schematic I have a GPIO 18 connected to uh, one leg of the the LED part of the opto isolator, and then uh, basically a resistor connecting back out um, back to back to ground. Um, so what an opto isolator does is an opto isolator allows you to um, close a connection but have that be electrically isolated. So why that's important is when you're connecting two pieces of electronics and you're shorting things to ground and making those kinds of connections, um, there is the potential for electricity to leak back. Um, you know, and we can put extra diodes places and things like that, but really the safest way to do make that kind of connection is to use either a, a relay an actual like physical mechanical relay or an opto isolator or a, kind of like an optical relay if you will um, and an opto isolator basically has inside of it has like a little led and a little um basically a, a photoresistor so that when the led is on the circuit closes and when the led is off the circuit is open um, so on the other side of the opto isolator i connected a 3.5 millimeter jack and I wired uh, I wired up the the cable that you see there on the bottom right corner 
Um, I wired up the appropriate connector for uh, audio in and audio out. I connected that to a USB sound card, which uh, for the Raspberry Pi, um, it does have the ability to output sound, but it doesn't have the ability to input sound. Um, so you really do need a USB, uh, a USB sound card for that. Um, and there's a few really cheap $10 USB sound cards. I think I used a Saiba SYBA sound card. Um, uh, and I think it was like $10. They're really cheap. Uh, and then I wired up another 3.5 millimeter jack for the push to talk. And I uh, wired that up to an old uh, parallel printer cable that I lopped one of the ends off. Um, and connect that to the back of the radio. And um, that allows me to control push to talk by toggling the GPIO pin on the Raspberry Pi. Um, for me, I wanted to get on APRS. Um, so I was using, I'm using the Direwolf uh, virtual TNC software and it's literally one line of, of code, the configuration to say use GPIO 17 or 18 or whichever one you have connected. Use that GPIO pin for push to talk and then Direwolf knows uh, when I need to push to talk, I, I toggle GPIO 17, that's push to talk. Um, so, and so that makes it really easy. And since I used a jack here, uh, just a 3.5 millimeter jack, I can make a cable, a similar cable for another type of radio. If I had, uh, you know, say an old Yesu or, or something that had uh, a, a similar style of push to talk, uh, uh, that that's just basically it just needs a a switched on you know shorted to ground type connection um, that'd make that very easy to connect um, you could even do uh, do a similar thing where you have two of these opto isolators on two on two separate gpio pins and for some radios they have the ability to trigger uh, CW, cw uh the transmission of cw so um you could have two of these with with two connectors and you could not only enable push to talk, but you could also uh, trigger CW. So um, you could just have the one cable, connect, uh, cable connected and do both of those. Um, so that'd be really easy to do. This is a really simple circuit. I know it doesn't look like a whole lot, but it doesn't take a whole lot. Um, it doesn't take much to do that. Um, so uh, I highly recommend giving that a shot. Um, one of the things that some people talk about when um, when they talk about connecting these radios to the USB sound cards, they're concerned about um, isolating the audio, so the audio in and the audio out. I didn't do that in this case, um, just because I'm using a little USB sound card and I'm not super worried about it. If, if the radio melts the USB sound card, I'm not going to cry too much. Um, but if you are worried about that, a, an easy way to do that, if you don't want to build your own kind of, uh, you know, audio transformer circuit, you can buy what's called a ground loop isolator. And they even have ground loop isolators that uh, use 3.5 millimeter jacks on each end. Um, so in this case, I could just buy two, opto, uh, two uh, ground loop isolators. Um, they're like eight bucks a piece. Um, and I could just hook those up in line and that would solve the problem of, of uh, isolating the uh, the audio um, and a, an audio transformer is basically just two you know you know two windings around a common uh, you know ferrite core uh, so it, that also electrically isolates um, one side from the other so that you don't have to worry about voltage spikes taking one or the other device out um, for me uh, if if you're over modulating it's super easy to just in in the digital mixer, just turn the sound card down. So, uh, if you turn the sound card down, then you then you don't overmodulate if you're you're too uh, loud, if you will. So, um, that's uh, that's kind of my simple DIY solution, my uh, circuit for you there. Um, the schematic and everything, uh, as well as this entire presentation, is going to be available on my GitHub. Um, so, with that, let's get into the demo. So, um, I'm going to pause my recording here and then I'm going to switch to the demo. Welcome back. So what I'm going to be doing today is a demonstration of a slow scan TV QSO. I'm going to be using an iPad and I'm uh, using a SSTV app on the iPad. I'll be doing the, the transmission and receiving on the iPad. The way I'm going to do that is I'm basically going to use a, a very simple Bofeng radio. Uh, the Bofeng radio is, can, is tuned to 145-500, um, just using basic simplex, not using a repeat or anything. 
This is a very common uh, frequency that's used in North America to call CQ and transmit images uh, on SSTV. Um, <clears throat> you can do this with a, a technician license um, and uh, you can also just monitor this channel uh, and use uh, an iPad or an iPhone uh, to listen to see if anyone's broadcasting SSTV images. Um, you, again, you don't need a license to, broad to listen, uh, you only need a license to broadcast. So uh, I'm not even using a cable or anything, I just have my, my iPad here and you just hold the radio close to the iPad. Um, you can use an iPhone for this as well. Um, or an Android device. There's a ton of apps on Android, um, but I've got the uh, uh, I've, I've got the the view of my iPad up on the screen here. So <clears throat> this app is really basic. Um, some of the more advanced apps, um, like the ones you can get for uh, Linux and uh, Windows um, and even Mac, uh, will actually transmit CW at the beginning and end of your of your transmission. Um, so uh, if I'm using an app that doesn't transmit CW, I'll just uh, get on, uh, it, when I key up, I'll announce myself, and then I'll start the, uh, the uh, SSTV transmission. So let's go ahead and do that. Um, I'm going to call CQ, and then my, uh, my father-in-law, who is also a ham operator, is going to respond, and then I'll, uh, I'll do a 73 and, and uh, give him a signal report and, and the QSO there. So let's go ahead and get started. This is K4CHN calling CQ via SSTV. So what I'll do here real quick, I've already got this set up um, to transmit this image and I'm going to go ahead and start transmitting. Okay, so one of the things that you saw me doing kind of at the beginning there as I was uh, moving the image around, th what I was doing was tuning the, the phase and the skew. Um, this app can actually decode at the same time as it transmits. Um, so you saw that image come in um, and I was just uh, adjusting it a little bit so I could uh, monitor the progress. So once he receives that image, uh, once he receives that, he's going to build his own reply image, uh, and then he'll send that back to me, and we'll see that here. Go ahead, TG5TEU. He's going to go ahead and send me a 73 back.
All right. So uh, the uh, auto start didn't kick in for some reason that time. So I went ahead and hit start. So that's why we've got a little bit of the uh, image missing off the bottom there. It's something to pay attention to. Also think about uh, when you're transmitting, make sure that um, you're not putting too much data at the top or the bottom because a lot of times that gets cut off. Um, also, while I was receiving, I was adjusting the, uh, the phase and the skew. Um, so this, what this does is it allows you to kind of tune because it's, it doesn't always get started perfectly and it doesn't always hear it perfectly. So now that we've received his reply, let's go ahead and build a, 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 a receive report and a 73 image. So what I'm going to do is select an image. Um, so I've got an image ready to go here. Uh, I'll build my reply text and then let's take a preview. That's the image that I want to send. So now let's go ahead and transmit that image. So that's a, a, just a basic example of a, a QSL on SSTV. Um, you can do this on, uh, on Simplex VHF like I did here. Uh, you can also do this on HF. Um, <clears throat> and if you're watching this video later, you can actually hold up a smartphone and uh, decode this, the images that I transmitted as they're, they're being transmitted here out of this video. Um, th this mode is actually uh, a lot of fun. Um, I monitor 14.230 a lot. Um, I use that on my Raspberry Pi. Um, I run the, uh, an SSTV app on, in Linux on Raspberry Pi and just monitor. And sometimes if I don't want to get my Raspberry Pi out, I'll just turn my 991 on and, uh, and set my iPhone down next to it and see what I get. Um, I also use a, a Teton uh, 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 shortwave radio that can receive a single sideband. And sometimes I'll turn that on on the 14 230 or some of the other bands depending on what time of day it is and uh, and just set my iPhone and see what I get um, so this is a lot of fun you don't need a license to receive again um, you can anyone can monitor the radio um, and see what images are flying around out there um, so um, that's my demonstration I hope you enjoyed it now back to my presentation so thanks for attending my talk uh, if you'd like to stay in touch with me uh, one of the best places to, to stay in touch with me is on, on my github um, I'm also on Twitter uh, as at Jay Marler, although I'm not very active on Twitter. Um, but uh, GitHub is where you'll find uh, the, this presentation and uh, some of my other open source projects. Um, this presentation is going to be available at that link in uh, PDF and HTML format. Um, also, you can email me at uh, k4chn uh, kilo4 charlie hotel november at arrl.net. Um, and I'll be walking around the conference um, so, and I'll be in the ham radio village. So if you're going to be 
on site in Vegas, uh, I, and you want to stay, you want to say hi. Please feel free to, to stop and say hi. And uh, if you see me on Discord, uh, please uh, feel free to, to say hi on Discord and uh, ask me any questions you have. Um, and uh, if not, I hope you have a great conference. Thanks.